Okay, so that is that is uh, one agency working together. Mm -hmm. um, were there other um, officers from different agencies? There were. And, and if so, which you've already answered, <laughs> it, how did that um, interrupt or not interrupt? How did that come into play with you dispatching? Or was was there was there no confusion as a result of? There was minimal confusion. Um, I believe that the agencies that came onto the scene at the beginning had our radio frequency available, but um, there was not. They identified themselves perfectly. They said their agency and their normal call sign. We had no way to put them into CAD, so I think it was just miscellaneous on in the call. Um, uh, but they kept off the radio as much as possible, which made my job much easier. Um, because it, although a lot of us train similarly, I think, and use similar type codes, they're not exactly the same. And to have somebody in an extreme situation trying to communicate in a way that is their default um, with their own agency could potentially be really problematic. And it, and it was not on that day. It was fairly, fairly easy con uh, communication. Mm -hmm. Did you find yourself using plain language or did you continue with the, the typical San Bernardino Police Department jargon? I think I didn't even think about using plain language. I don't recall saying, oh, I got to say this in a way that they're all going to understand. And it didn't even come, that's a good point, it didn't even come to my mind. Okay. Um, but I don't, I don't recall anybody needing clarification on anything. Were you talking to the helicopter, also known as 40 King? Yes. So you're in communication with them. And was he guiding you with inf or giving you information, updates or locations? Some, uh, when he came overhead, uh, he said there was a security guy in the parking lot. Um, he was saying where different crowds of people were moving towards. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, he's one of those pieces of the puzzle that was, was integral to the success of it really. Mm -hmm. um, and later on, during the day when they located the suspects, having him overhead was absolutely necessary. Speaking of um, running into the suspects, um, how did that influence your job in the sense of, okay, I have a crime scene, I'm working it, and we, or were you aware of the location of the suspect's house in Redlands? Did you have any visual on that? And then in addition to adding to the mix, the suspect's vehicle being spotted. Yeah. How, how did you play a role in those three or potentially play a role in those three? So we had several citizens call in and I'm, I'm assuming they heard it on a scanner, the description of the vehicle um, that they called in and, and said that they had spotted the vehicle. Um, I think several of those accounts were discounted. Um, uh, but they, we did have the one gentleman who actually saw the suspect vehicle over by the park. Um, that information came to me through uh, lines in CAD in the incident itself because they had called into the dispatch center to give us that information. The information about where the house in Redlands was, I think, came um, later after uh, the detectives had located it and I, I knew in the back of my head roughly where it was, but I hadn't looked at a map to see it because that I was sort of leaving that part of the incident to them. They were doing their own thing. That's what they do normally. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll come up with the information that dispatch or everybody else needs to know when it's necessary just to keep minimizing the chatter and um, coordinating between units and such. Okay, so you, you, you work primary. Yes. Did you ever have a secondary channel working as a primary? You know, but actually we had three. You had three, yeah, and and at a moment we had four. Um, so we had uh, the incident was on primary. We have secondary radio, which is typically an administrative radio. They run warrants and things like that. Um, and she became the sort of the logistics radio, if you will. Uh, so they coordinated getting victims out. They coordinated the bus, where the buses were gonna go. They coordinated which hospitals were being used, um, which agencies were at what locations. Mm -hmm. That radio, I honestly think was way busier than my radio was. And she did a phenomenal job, really, really well done. We had a third radio open up because there still was happenings going on in San Bernardino not related to this incident that we had to deal with. Right. Um, so we had another operator on that radio channel. 
thank goodness that 11 o'clock came and more people came into dispatch and then an additional people came in as their shifts began or as they came through and figured out we needed some help. Um, and then a fourth radio opened up very briefly in the early afternoon and I, and then was closed again, but there was some other detail happening that I don't remember what it was about. And so um, did you work the, the suspects uh, capturing as well on the, your initial primary? Yes. On the third radio, there was a call within the city of some kind of a pursuit going on. And initially we thought maybe it was related to the IRC incident. It turned out to be completely unrelated. Um, they ended up crashing into the animal control fence or something like that. And so it was fairly quickly discounted as not related to the IRC. Shortly after that, then they found the suspects in Redlands and headed in a pursuit towards the city. And that one then switched from, I think it was on narcotics channel or somewhere, then, then switched to primary. Um, so then it became our... So I, I understand that that narcotics unit actually flagged down a Redlands sergeant yeah. who was driving a black and white police vehicle. Yep. And so they, they gave him the the, the information. Yep. There's your suspect vehicle right there. Were you listening to uh, the Redlands Police Department primary channel? Do you have a means to, to do that? Or was somebody else doing that? Or can you explain that? For All me? of the consoles, uh, with uh, one or two exceptions, in our dispatch center at San Bernardino have the ability to listen to the radio, and I I think that's really really important because then the call takers can hear what's going on in the radio and and make the information they're getting on the phone relevant to the call that's working. Um, so uh, at the radio where I was working, we also have the access to listen to other frequencies of, of agencies around us, mm -hmm. and I did have Redlands up just to see what because they're fairly close uh, from a geographic standpoint, um, that the potential existed that things were gonna roll into their city limits and it's good just to kind of have an eye on what's going on around you. So yet another duty, <laughs> another responsibility. You know, it would be interesting to do a checklist of oh, exactly gosh. all the things <laughs> you are expected yeah. and did do. Well, the, the honest truth is I could not have done that by myself. Um, there's no possible way anybody could have done that by themselves. And that's why I really relied on the crew that I had with me that day um, and, and the teamwork that happened just sort of organically. Right. Because okay. I was not the only one listening to Redlands Channel. Sure, <laughs> the sure. Other, the other girls who were around me um, were doing the same and the gentleman who was, there was a guy there. Yeah, and I guess what matters is that you, somebody on that team picks up the important parts yes. and shares it. Yes. Yeah, because one person can't be expected to do all of the work well. As a team, the team can do the work very well. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, you know, it is it does become impossible, I think, to a certain point to expect a dispatcher to do all of these things. So I think at one point you guys had a, a whiteboard and used it as uh, as a way of sharing information. Yep. How did that work? How did that first come to be? And tell me how that worked out and the, the, you know what you ended up doing with that. Or... Because I was losing track of information because it was coming in so fast and the CAD system was scrolling through it so quickly, um, I didn't have a, in, a way to easily say the really important information, what the suspect looked like, what the car looked like, if we had a plate, um, maybe the last location they were seen. Mm -hmm. And there was no easy way for me to share that with the rest of the people who were in dispatch at the time because uh, there were people calling in, detectives or other agencies asking for this information. Um, and we didn't have a whiteboard in dispatch proper. So I asked one of the girls to go into the supervisor's office and pull it off the wall. <laughs> Don't tell anybody in facilities. Um, and so they pulled it off of the wall and brought it out into dispatch. And so we were able to list those things where it was obvious to everybody. So people wouldn't walk into dispatch and say, hey, what's the plate of blah, blah, blah. I would just point at the board and say, there, there it is. Yeah, it was easier on everybody. Okay, and then, and then uh, eventually that was used for, uh, again, important information yeah. such as phone numbers? Yeah, um, as soon as the IRC incident itself sort of got buttoned up at the end of the day, the whiteboard stayed out and we put on the FBI's contact number for the public because we had so many people from the public calling in and giving us tips that they thought were important. Um, and because the FBI had taken over the investigation, we were fairly easily 
able to send them over to the FBI's. So it sounds like uh, another lesson learned. Yes, very much. Um, now let's fast forward to today. Are you aware or familiar with any technological advancements towards that in which we can have uh, some sort of electronic whiteboard or are you? I, I understand there is one uh, that is available. I don't, I have not seen it function, so I'm not, I can't really speak well mm. to it. Um, but I know it exists. Um, I hope to try it here in the next six months or so. Um, and theoretically, you, you can write information on this board and make it accessible to each of the consoles within your, your, co your comm center. Well, what an idea. Yeah, it's great. I hope <clears throat> it works. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So I understand uh, three to four hours from the initial call to the suspect being detained and, and captured, that's three or four hours in a matter of a few minutes of a discussion with you. Mm -hmm. But I, I understand that you went on a dispatch marathon. Uh, you you worked was. for how long? How many hours would you say that you worked that day on People the radio? People ask me and I can't remember. Oh, the radio, I think. I th the radio must have been 10 or 11 hours, I think. 10 or 11 hours. Let's just say 10 hours just to keep it even. Yeah. I, but I don't want to try and cut you short because no. we know it's probably longer than 10 hours based on your memory. What? Does Annie Teal feel like after ten hours on the radio during a during a critical incident, with or without a break, how did you feel? I was a little pooped. <laughs> I was a little. I think my brain was more tired than anything. Um, uh, but and and again, this really goes back to the kind of support that you have around you. And and I got um, so much support from my crew that was there. But I got support from other agencies that were calling in asking if we needed help with anything. They were sending food. Um, and I there was really no time at which during that day that I felt like we were an island and really nobody was gonna help us. We got help from from the get-go, we were getting help. And that and that was that was really ten hours probably without a break. Oh yeah, I didn't really get a break. <laughs> I think in the middle at, <clears throat> before they located the suspect again, <clears throat> um, I took a little walk around and came him back. Did you want to get off the radio? Selfishly, no, because uh, so I started the, the incident started just before 11, I believe, um, and I was due to get off the radio at noon. Uh, and so the girl who was coming on duty was to be my relief. And she actually, we had a quick conversation as to whether she wanted to take it over because it was very complex. And sometimes it's hard to debrief that and hand it off to somebody else. And that if I had a regret for the day, I do regret not handing it off because as a supervisor, I don't belong on the radio and I shouldn't have had that spot. It just seemed easier at the time because she had a trainee and because I knew what was going on before she got here, it just seemed easier to hang on to it. And then it just sort of unfolded into itself, but that is a regret for the day. This may seem like an unfair question with you not being given much time to think. Do you think the events in the dispatch center would have been altered or changed for the better or for the worse if there was a supervisor doing supervisory duties only? And if so, what might they have been? Uh, definitely would have been better to have a supervisor in there um, doing just supervisor stuff the unfortunate thing about San Bernardino is that they are very short staffed, as are many dispatch centers. Um, and so the the dual responsibilities they have are, are to be a dispatcher and to be a supervisor. Um, and it's uh, the things that I think a supervisor could have done were to call the IT department and, and themselves. Mm -hmm. I had somebody call them for me, but to explain why I wanted them over and they're not just you need to get over here right now, but to have a little better communication amongst different divisions. Um, I could have more systematically figured out who we needed to come in and work in, div in the division um, because people just showed up willy-nilly, which was great. I, I fully appreciate having extra bodies in there, but there was no coordination about who was going to stay for how long or what their roles were going to be um, and being able to take people off the radio as needed to give them a little mental break. Um, it, it just seems like from a personnel standpoint, having mm -hmm. a supervisor available would have been healthier for everybody. Is it fair to say um, that a lot of small agencies include their supervisor as a minimum? Yeah. And that because they're a small agency, I'm talking 
probably 15 or less, 15 to 20 dispatchers per communication center. Um, that it's, it's understandable that you need sometimes a working supervisor. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, and, I, and I'm asking, um, a lesson learned is to have minimums, but plus one supervisor. Yeah. So have, have minimums of your four or three dispatchers, whatever, whatever that date and time calls for, but to not necessarily include a supervisor as a minimum. Yeah, fully agree with you. Um, practically, I'm not sure that's doable consistently. Yeah, because sometimes staffing just goes down and you don't want to tax your dispatchers who are working so hard to begin with by saying, well, I'm here, but I'm not going to do your job because that's your job. It be, it's, I think it's a nature of a dispatcher to want to be able to help. And when staffing shortages happen, that is our nature to go and, sure. and help. And, and I, see, that goes along with the spirit of teamwork. Yeah. That goes along with the spirit of taking care of your people. Yeah. I, and, and, and there's a balance. There is. The difficult part is determining it, I assume. Yeah, it, it, it is It is a difficult part. And um, now I know from having visited a couple other agencies and working at a new agency, um, I know that there are um, some really good ways to get things done. And it's, um, I, 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 my hope for dispatch centers is that they stay open-minded to, to hear new ideas about how to do things better. And that is one of them, is have your supervisor be a supervisor. Don't have them be a dispatcher.